Hello everybody, um, I am Jenny Jones, I'm the Managing Director here at Dragon Origins um, and this morning we have got a really interesting conversation that we'd like to share with you. Um, one of the things which we believe is really important here at Dragon Origin is to have interesting conversations with experts who know other stuff. Um, so <laughs> we've had a range of these recently um, and, <clears throat> one, and, and we're going to continue that today with a conversation all about matrescence. Now, um, I'll introduce um, Susanna shortly, but the background to this is that we, in, in, you know, in, for us, it's really important that we have a culture and a workplace that is really inclusive and really welcoming for everybody. Um, so this is a subject which is particularly close to my own heart. Um, so on that note, I shall introduce Susanna and then we'll introduce Dee Dee um, and then we'll go into, into the conversation from there. Um, so, Susanna <laughs> um, is so you're the founder of the Maternity Pledge. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to give a bit of a flavour as to what that is? Yes, please? yes, definitely. So the Maternity Pledge is a social enterprise, and it's been set up essentially to kind of cover two things. So one is to help businesses have a more successful maternity leave and return to work program, because all of the data, all of the stories that come out show that not only is there a motherhood penalty. But there is also lots and lots of women dropping out of the workforce yeah. after they return from maternity leave. So they'll mm. come back to maternity leave, find that um, it's not working for them anymore, and they'll leave. So that's a shame. You're, yeah. you're losing women from the workforce. Yeah. You're losing the opportunity for women to continue up the ladder and be in those leadership roles. So it's trying to answer that problem. But also it's addressing the wellness issue around perinatal mental health. And the fact that... Um, you know, 100% of women go through what is called matrescence, but matrescence is not a term that is widely no, known I had about. No, I had not heard about no, it no. until we met. Exactly, exactly. And I think matrescence is, is described as a sort of the transition to motherhood, the process of becoming a mother. And it's a developmental phase mm. that you go through. It's likened to adolescence, very sort of similar in, um, in what's going on in your brain and your body and your hormones and your identity. Mm. There's a real shift. And what I often like to think about is their, the stats for sort of a postnatal disorder are kind of one in ten, which you know is, is higher than it should be anyway, because no one ever wants to get that, but it's there. But what about the other nine? Like how are those people doing? Because it's not joyful all the time and they're experiencing matrescence, which can be a bit of a grey area of motherhood. So the idea is that there's a there's a wellness thing there and that if we can educate people on matrescences, they understand what they're going through. Yeah. They understand that it's quite normal. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like failures because their version of motherhood doesn't necessarily match up with this sort of societal mm -hmm. narrative of motherhood that we've been sold. Mm -hmm. um, and it improves their mental health, improves their ability to talk about what they're experiencing. Yeah. And as such, the maternity pledge is there to answer sort of those two parts of like, let's keep women in the workplace yeah. who want to be in the workplace, but let's also make sure they're mentally well and well to come back into the workplace. So that's that's why it exists. Yeah, it is a <clears throat> complicated old thing. And yeah. I remember when, um, and Didi will come on to, to talking about the employment side mm -hmm. of things um, and the rules and regulations um, that are relevant in this space shortly. Um, I remember before we had our first child going to going to lessons about how to change or well, how to you know the, the birth um but then also how to bath them mm -hmm. um and what sort of colour of poo to look for <laughs> um those sorts of things but none none of that actually talked about the process that would happen to me like actually becoming a mother mm -hmm. um so <clears throat> obviously matrescence is sounds like it's about mums mm -hmm. like maternal. How does it how does it impact people who haven't have biologically carried children? Yeah. Is it relevant it to is. them as well? So this is where it gets a bit interesting. So the, it, it's a very understudied area. So I'll be quite honest in that because women's health in general is quite understudied. Um, but there is definitely a belief that matrescence occurs even if you don't um, carry a child biologically right. because you are still experiencing that huge identity shift. So particularly if you're um, a working woman and you enjoy being in the workplace and most people are having children biologically and non-biologically um, later in life, so you've got a certain level of seniority to your career and then that is shifted away from you. So you're experiencing that, you're experiencing your identity shift, you're experiencing the way you look at the world is, is different, 
the kind of environment they're going to inherit. I mean, I think more so now than mothers certainly would have felt beforehand during what is this climate that they're going to be growing up in um, from a technology perspective and from an environmental perspective. All of those things are happening. And what's quite interesting at the moment is there is this sort of emerging sort of neuroscience. So when you become a mother, so when you become a mother biologically, there is neuroscience that says that your brain physically changes. Like it actually physically changes in a way that they didn't used to think happened. They thought it only happened in adolescence and yeah. then that's it, your brain for life. Wow. And now they're realising that your brain is more malleable than that. Wow. And the idea of baby brain or mummy brain or whatever you want to call it um, is real. It does happen. You do lose bits of your brain. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, but it is many, the, the whole point is that it's trying to trim away those kind of things that maybe don't matter as much, like the Spice Girls lyrics, the two become one, which... I think matter a lot but you know you mm. get rid of that so that you can become more efficient and more flexible in recognizing somebody else's i.e your baby's needs mm. and being able to look after them so but what they've now seen is happening is that even people that don't have a baby when they are um sort of caring for children their brains change mm. so by caring for children interacting with children so fathers non-biological mothers even like they start looking to like nursery nurses and childminders their brain changes. And grandparents as well, maybe? I, maybe, I don't, I don't haven't guess. seen any research specifically <laughs> yeah. on grandparents, but caregivers as a whole, yeah. mm -hmm. by interacting with, with children, your brain changes to adapt to that, which I think is then really interesting from an evolutionary perspective of this idea of that it takes a village and the kind of push towards paternity leave mm -hmm. being six weeks because actually anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. Your brain is going to adapt to care for this child. The idea of it being a sort of maternal instinct feels like maybe that's a bit of a myth. Perhaps we've been sold. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting to say that, you know, people that go through adoption, through surrogacy, fathers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, grandparents, they can care for children. It doesn't have to be the mother. And that's an interesting point, but it is, to kind of, I guess, slightly counter like that, mothers um, and I guess non-biological mothers as well, they go through matrescence and that is quite a profound and life-changing experience. So, you know, it's, it, it does work both ways, but I think it's important to kind of make that argument that, you know, fathers can care for children too. <laughs> yes, yes. Indeed. Really, it's really interesting. I didn't know about the. I didn't know that um, if you were not a mother, that it actually changed yeah. your brain. Mm. I didn't know. I that had no idea. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, science lesson. It's all the people yeah. sitting and playing and having all the chats and all the patience. It's that like the the extra for the patience that you learn. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Not putting their shoes on or brushing their teeth for the tenth time. Yes, <laughs> yes it happens. <laughs> game again. <laughs> <laughs> um. So how does when we think about? So I mean, I've had two children. Mm. And they are six and nine, and so I have had two pregnancies um, and was working both times. Mm -hmm. um, so I know uh, that certainly from my perspective, um, it's, I mean, you, you get tired towards the end of the pregnancy, my feet swelled up, which was delightful. Mm -hmm. um, and it does become hard right at the end. I found it hard at the end to concentrate you know, right towards the end because your head, your brain is probably shifting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what else through all your work have you seen um, for those who haven't gone through it themselves? What is the impact of, of pregnancy on working mothers? I mean, it, it, it's big, it, it's huge, but it's not to say you can't do the work anymore. It just be, might mean that things need to be a little bit more flexible to be aware of the fact that your brain and your body and your hormones, they're all kind of changing mm -hmm. and you're kind of getting ready for this sort of big shift in, in life, really. Um, I mean, I think the concerning thing is that I think it's sort of 54,000 women are pushed out of work for being pregnant, for daring to procreate, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a concerning statistic. Um, and I think there could be more that can be done to support women, but equally they're not fragile mm -hmm. you know you can still work you can still do things it's just about having those kind of open conversations of what each each individual person needs because pregnancy i mean i, I don't know anything else apart from like pregnancy and childbirth that has a kind of longer list of sort of side effects but those side effects don't happen to everybody and your pregnancies will be no different to my pregnancies and what yeah. you needed will be different to what i needed yeah so i think it's just making sure that you have those open lines of communication so you can check in on physical and on mental health and say, 
what do you need, how can I help you, but also as a business, understanding how can the business still run effectively with you being part of it and valuing your productivity, but be mindful that actually, as you say, as you start to get further and further into pregnancy, it's a, it is a big strain on your body. And yeah. I think it's recognising that and understanding that, particularly if you're not being through it yourself. You're not just getting larger. There's a, there's a lot of other things that might be... Well, I think it would be part of it, making sure that you have an environment where colleagues feel safe to share challenges mm. is, is, a, is, is important, whatever the challenge may be. Yeah. And then just being having the time, the managers having the time and the space to and the skills to mm. ask the right questions and listen to the answers and provide the support. Exactly. that they need. So, um, Didi, I'm going to bring you in here. So, would you like to introduce yourself first? Because I've got a related question which has just sparked in my head. <laughs> so, um, yes, my name is Didi and I'm an employment solicitor here at Dragon Argent. And so, what I will probably touch on isn't as interesting as yours because it's like the uh-huh. boring legal <laughs> bit, if you like, but yeah, equally as important, I guess. <laughs> so, one of the things which Didi I'd like to ask is about the protected characteristic yes. side of questioning in the in the, the recruitment or interview process yes. which is quite the specific question and yeah. um, but is one that we're we're talking about quite a lot ourselves so we um in terms of uh, in terms of hiring people who are pregnant yes. or people who perhaps are of an age where pregnancy might be yeah. coming up how, what is the legal advice about how to do that properly so women in the UK can't be discriminated against because of the fact that they're pregnant and that happens all the way from recruitment and into their employment so if for example they were in uh, an interview and the interviewer is asking them of like you know when are you expecting to maybe give birth or have a child you need to be very careful the way that they're asking about it, about it because you don't want it to appear that you've not maybe given somebody a job because of the mere fact that they're pregnant, because it's just this direct discrimination, essentially. And you've got to be very careful. So the 54,000 people that you mentioned mm-hmm. that have been discriminated mm-hmm. against, presumably in, a, in an instance where people don't know the right questions, whether inadvertently or, or kind of deliberately, they, they do discriminate against people. What, do, what, would, what would somebody in that position do? So in terms of the employee, like yeah. the candidate, for yeah. example, well, they could bring a claim for discrimination um, and they can do that even if they're not an employee. So they could go to the tribunal and say, look, I've been discriminated against because um, I'm, I'm pregnant or I was thinking of wanting to be pregnant and potentially the cost to the business reputationally and then the actual cost for paying out for that sort of claim yeah. uh, it's, can be really high. Yeah, so making sure that you, making sure that the people who are interviewing and at every stage of conversations are aware of the sort of main facts of the yes. Equality Act, for example, yeah. is something which is important because that does cover maternity, yeah. but it also does cover race and other various yeah. you know various other parts and of what, discrimination. And what's really interesting is even if a candidate wasn't pregnant, they would still be captured by the Equality Act because that means that you've discriminated against them because maybe they're a woman. A woman who was thinking of being pregnant mm-hmm. so it would capture them either on the pregnancy side or for the fact of their sex yeah um so back to the maternity pledge mm-hmm. what exactly is it please good question, <laughs> good question so the maternity pledge i was speaking to lots of women and we naturally ended up talking about their maternity experience and a lot of women were telling me that their return to work hadn't been so great. And it wasn't sort of sensational stories that you read in the headlines or anything like that. It wasn't really anything to do with their pay or their length of leave. It was the fact that they didn't feel valued. And it's the fact that they didn't feel supported. And it's the fact that they didn't feel like they'd been well communicated with. But obviously all those things are really hard to put into a policy because they're not really <laughs> tangible. Yeah. So then what the maternity pledge is, is it's more like a framework. So it's five pillars that focus on communication, support and empathy. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you kind of follow these five pillars and therefore at all points through pregnancy, maternity leave and the return to work, you are showing those things. And you as as the employer are leading the dialogue. So for example, one of the pillars of the pledge is to create a maternity leave and return to work action plan, of which there is a template within the pledge to use. 
and it's about when that person confirms their pregnancy at work, asking them how do you feel mentally, how do you feel physically, mm -hmm. is there anything we can do? Um, let's have a conversation now about what you feel like your return to work you might want it to be, you might want it to look like. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you have to stick with, especially when you're first pregnant, you still think nothing will change, mm -hmm. and then you realise that it does. But it's just, it means that that employee knows they can have the conversation. And really, it's about those soft touches and those human touches, not necessarily coming to, like, this is the exact thing that we're going to do. It's about saying, you can have a conversation with us about it, especially if maybe they're one of the first pregnancies in the uh, business, or they don't know anybody else in the business that has gone through it, so they're not really sure what to ask. And when you are pregnant, you don't know what to ask, and you don't necessarily know what you um, are allowed to have, mm. and you need your employer to lead the way. So that's kind of what the pledge is about. It's about saying, we are going to kind of give you a blueprint of how to kind of navigate this and ensure that by being part of the pledge that you feel valued, you feel supported. And if because this is just how life goes. If that person, your your point person, your line manager or your HR person, um, you know, finds another job or gets moved to a different part of the business while you're on maternity leave, because let's face it, that happens. It's nobody's fault. That's just the way life works. There is a record of all the conversations that you've had, so that whoever kind of comes into that role as your point person can pick up and go, oh, it's okay. So you were talking about this, and do you still feel this mm -hmm. way? You know, you've come in on a keeping in touch day and we're going to make sure that this is planned for and you're doing this. And do you still feel like when you when you come back, we you know what to we want to approach it this way and this has worked really well in the past? And just it's just about openness and about yeah. support. And then that person slot doesn't slot back in. It takes six months to assimilate back into the workplace, let's be honest. But you know, this they come back in feeling valued and like they've been listened to all yeah. the way through the process and actually it's just the human touches, but they're so easily forgotten and they're just not easy to write into a, a policy. And that's kind of what the pledge is there to do. Yeah, um, having, um, having templates and um, sort of structure for our managers is something which we, we work quite hard on because I think it's, it's really hard if you're a manager to know all the right things, you know, to, to know what's expected of you and to, to be to feel equipped to have all the conversations that you need to have as part of your role. Um, so that was why we have signed up to your maternity <laughs> pledge. Um, because I love this. Just show it to the camera. <laughs> this is the actual, this is the pad, the, the notebook that you get. And what's really helpful, what, what I found really useful with this and with the conversations that I've personally had with two colleagues of ours who have gone off on maternity, is just that it does give the structure to, it makes me remind, remember the right questions to ask mm -hmm. um, and it prompts me in things I would have completely forgotten and it and it gives you ideas that I would never even have thought about. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and I suppose that, I mean, I know that yesterday you were at an event yesterday yeah. um, and I mean, were there any sort of insights that you had from that which would be worth I think sharing? Well, what, what came up yesterday, I was in I was at the Women in Work Summit yesterday, which was um, fascinating and we had lots of amazing speakers and one of the speakers um, did uh, did say what I found from my own research of speaking to women that it was down to the particular manager they had as to how good their maternity leave was. Wow. So yeah. it's like a postcode lottery in some ways. Like if you have a great manager who's really empathetic, probably been through it themselves or had a partner that's been through it or you know or whatever the situation is, then you could end up with a really lovely maternity leave. If your pal that sits, you know, two seats over has a different manager yeah. who perhaps isn't as supportive or not even that, just isn't as aware of or you know, of what to say or the right thing to say or what to do. Um, they might have a worse return to leave and return to work and not feel supported and they're sitting in the same office two seats away. So it's about giving some level of consistency yeah. as well and just a prompt, like you say, a prompt for people. It doesn't have to be, you know, in the HR department, it could be a line manager, just a prompt for them to know and to understand of what stage they're at. Just making sure it's productive for everybody, like a keeping in touch day. What's the point of doing the keeping in touch day unless it's going to be useful for yeah. everyone? You've probably got a really good brain coming back into the office, so why not use it rather than just having them sitting at a computer that's not really 
set up and mm. people are going about their, their normal day and not finishing what you've planned because mm. then that person comes in and feels like it's a bit of a waste of their time yeah. and already, oh, I'm not really valued here. Mm. I'm not really looking forward to coming back because no one really, they've not sorted anything out mm. for me. So it, it's all those things and they, they go through your head. So yeah, I mean, consistency, consistency is really important with all of this and that definitely helps <clears throat> with, that helps. Yeah. Um, managers and that helps then us as a business be confident that actually all the employees you know the bigger we get the less the less likely it is that it will be me having the conversations like i've had them because both people have been reporting to me but that in the future that's not going to be the case yeah. and the more we scale the less likely it is to be me so the more we can equip our managers with the right tools then yeah. the more confidence that we can have that the right conversations are happening for both us and for the employees yeah. Yeah. and absolutely and also just from like a real kind of protection point of view, like what you're talking about with tribunals, it does give you a level of protection because it's if you are following this, it would be very hard for someone, I say this with zero legal, <laughs> it feels, allegedly feels very hard for someone to bring a case against you if you can say, oh, but we're part of the pledge and we've followed this template and we've given them this and, uh, you know, what more could we have, have, have done yeah. so it, it feels like a bit of a safety net for you as well yeah business. well it's a perfect segue yeah. <laughs> yeah. so talk to us please about the legal side of things like what do i as an employer what do i need to do what do i need to know what does the employee need to do yeah um and so they need to notify uh, their employer um, and then at that point the employee needs to do a risk assessment to make sure that the working environment is still safe for them to work. So for example, if you have someone who's doing heavy lifting, for example, you might have a reasonable adjustment now in place so that they don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. Or if they travel in and they work, walk far from the station into work, you might want it so that they can work from home a little bit more or maybe that they commute in times where it's not peak. So maybe you let them leave a little bit earlier mm. and come into work a little bit later to avoid the hustle and bustle, for example, if you're working in a city. And there's lots of miserable people who, even though you have a badge, don't give yes. you their seat. Exactly. <laughs> Not from your phones, people. <laughs> oh, goodness, that happens. Um, and then um, I think mm. employees now start thinking about what's going to happen when it comes to maternity leave. Yeah. Um, during the time that someone's on maternity leave, so statutory maternity leave is uh, 52 weeks mm -hmm. and it's split into two. So you've got your ordinary um, maternity leave, which mm -hmm. is 26 weeks, and your additional, which is another 26 weeks. So together it's a 52 week time. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and you don't necessarily get paid for all of it if an employer's only giving you statutory maternity pay. Mm -hmm. So statutory maternity pay is for 39 weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, and for the first six weeks, you get 90% of your wage. Yeah. And then after that, it's uh, what the government sets it at, which is something like £172 approximately, yeah. or 90%, whichever is lower. Okay. Um, and so what you do tend to find is that a lot of businesses may offer additional maternity pay because, as you can imagine, if you're only going to get paid for 39 weeks and it's not the full wage, sometimes it does need a bit of top and bottom. Mm. Um, so when you look at um, when you look at other employers um, and kind of best practice across the across various industries, I mean, I know Suzanne, I know you've got you're working with people in all sorts of different sectors, and, and same here. You know, some of our clients are tech, some of them are uh, retail. There's a whole you know right wait, there's a wide range of, of people that collectively we're talking to. What are the best um, policies, the best kind of employee benefits that you've seen in this? in this space? Me? I mean, well, interestingly, Vodafone has got one of the best. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed, I'm allowed to name yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Vodafone has got one of the best um, because it's very um, in inclusive for fathers as well. Okay. So I think that is, although this is called the maternity pledge, and I do often speak about this, about how it benefits fathers as well, uh, because it's important that, you know, that they read these packs, they fill out the postnatal forms with their partner, they understand what's going on. Um, I'm not in a position to change policy. 
Yeah. So obviously, right now the policy is two weeks. Um, Lib Dem came out literally, you know, the other the other day, uh, saying that they were voted in. They would make potentially six weeks. Okay. Uh, Vodafone, I think they have a twenty six week. I hope that's right. Oh. I hope it's twenty six weeks. Um, uh, but potentially, and it's which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. And they, they don't have to take it all at once. They can take like a chunk of it and then split it up and then take another chunk of it afterwards, because I think. Uh, certainly what is happening is fathers want to spend time with their children. There is research to say that if you are, if you connect with your child um, sort of early on, you will have a better relationship with them. It takes the pressure off the mother. Uh, you know, it must be incredibly hard to leave somebody after two weeks, leave your partner after two weeks. You might be struggling when you're off into the office or even if you're hybrid working, like off working in the attic at home or something, and you know they're finding it hard. There's probably a lot of guilt involved with that. There, um, it's probably difficult to kind of deal with the, the financial side that traditionally, mm. I mean, I'm talking generally, I'm talking heteronormal relationships, mm. I know it, it's different for the different people, but you know, you're now the other breadwinner and you're facing your own kind of change of identity called petrescence, uh, which is also quite transformative, but not recognized enough. And if you can, if you can work um, somewhere that, 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 that kind of recognises that as well and we kind of move into a more sort of gender equality across the board, then that's going to help mothers and fathers. And it's going to, again, sort of feel like the, 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 the load, I don't want to say burden of childcare because that just sounds awful, but you know, the, the childcare is hard and it is skewed towards the mother and therefore also affects their career that's a life where fathers benefit from becoming fathers and are held up as kind of a bit of an ideal and they earn more when they're a father and women earn less when they're a mother and it's frustrating <laughs> yes um, but yeah there are some companies that are doing are doing amazing things and um, if, they, if people can offer a hand to say that's fantastic but i would actually argue that the the human side of things goes a, um, a further goes a long way. Yeah, I think I mean certainly I mean, one of the mm -hmm. looking at the benefits that we have is something that's really important to me, and it's something we do a review every six months of all of the um, the benefits that we offer to all of our employees to make sure that they're useful um, and to listen to people and ask what other things that they would like and to see what's viable, what's not. Um, and I think from a so from a maternity and paternity um, perspective, um, we do offer enhanced enhanced um, which it, which we're really proud of actually because we are still pretty small um, and we do think that that the extra amount that people employees will get as a result will really help um, when the statutory is pretty low and yeah. um, so Didi from your point of view so there there's obviously the statutory paternity statutory maternity yeah. then there's shared parental leave yeah. which is a whole different kettle fish yeah and there's also um parental leave now this is the that the parental leave so i'll ask you to just give a quick summary of the first two in a second the parental leave is an interesting one because that's something which i think i'm going to start using i didn't actually know about until recently is that every until your child is 18 every year you're you can have one week it's, it is unpaid yeah. so it's no it's not really that I mean, it's no difference to just <coughs> having unpaid leave, yeah. but there is, a, there is an ability for every parent to have one week off um, until the age of, until the, the child is 18, yeah. which is helpful because yeah. obviously school holidays are ludicrously out of whack mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the number of holidays that you get when you work. Mm -hmm. And so can you just quickly summarize, so you, you've talked about this, you've talked about the maternity. Yeah. Um, is that the same with, patern with statutory paternity? No, so statutory paternity leave is only two weeks, if I remember correctly, and that's yeah. what they are pushing for, which we've touched on before, yeah. to have for longer, okay. and that's only for, um, well, it tends to be for, for dads, basically. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then shared parental leave is the option for both parents, or both caregivers, mm -hmm. primary and secondary, to actually share maternity leave, because as you know, the yeah. woman tends to get more. And so it has the option of a uh, father of a child, yeah. for example, being able to share that maternity leave. So it's, yeah, it's quite good. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of getting, we were definitely behind some other countries, but we're also ahead, ahead of others, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so we'll just wait and see how this all evolves. Obviously, as much as we would like to be in charge and writing the policy, unfortunately, <laughs> exactly. not quite able to do that. No, we'll see what the next government gives us. Yes. Probably changing government gives us. Well, that's it. Let's yeah. watch, watch this watch. space. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Didi, from a legal point of view, what else? Like, what have we not covered? Um, I think something that we've not covered is the fact that women actually have the right to take uh, antenatal, uh, well, time off for antenatal care. Okay. Um, and that's great, obviously, because that's something that you you need to prep for yeah. having a bit for having a baby. And I think yeah. it ties in quite nicely, actually, yeah. and the information reckons actually because you, yeah. you need to prep for the fact that you're about to have this child in your life. Yeah. Um, another thing is if you do have a child um, and you're breastfeeding, yeah. um, an employer does actually need to give you reasonable time off and reasonable facilities as well for you to be able to breastfeed or yeah. if you're expressing, for example. Yeah. Um, makes sense because obviously the baby needs to be still taken care of even yeah. if the woman is back at work. Yeah. Um, so I think those are the other two points that we've touched on. Okay. But I think what we've discussed before is obviously we've got statutory uh, paternity pay. Um, I think really it needs to be topped up a lot of the time because yeah. it doesn't give people the chance to basically stay as long as they, to have the full 52 weeks. You tend to see that women are probably going to come back earlier because they can't afford to stay off the whole time. Yeah. Because towards the end, actually, they're not entitled to anything at all. Yeah. And that's where it is diff- it's, it's a difficult balance between wanting to encourage, wanting to bring your employees, um, you know, wanting to create a, a workplace and an opportunity for them after maternity that is, you know, that builds yeah. in their skills and gives them, you know, a continued opportunity to thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, and and commercially supporting them as much as yeah. you can while they're off, but also balancing the fact that for some businesses, you know, for small businesses, when you, you know, the cost can you, you may want to give everything under the sun, yeah. but actually that then becomes tricky. Yeah. So it's trying to. So I think that's where the you know the enhanced pay is is, in, is an interesting um, option, but obviously that in itself there's an enormous range that in, what mm-hmm. enhanced pay can actually yeah. can actually mean. Yeah. One of the ideas which actually and actually we we've looked at this and I th- which I think is quite interesting is that some is that you in terms of the enhanced pay you can just pay their salary for longer. So the statutory is ninety you know ninety percent for six weeks, so you can do ninety percent for longer. Yeah. But you can also you as well as that then you can also after that part of the enhanced pay is finished, um, an idea that I've seen some companies do is just top up the statutory pay um, from X to Y, yeah. which actually, from an employer's point, employee's point of view is nice because it's additional, yeah. but actually from a cost point of view, it's also commercial because yeah. it doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't cost quite as much as 90% of the salary. Yeah. Um, so there are interesting and clever things that, people, yeah. that you can do, which balance the commercial side with with yeah. you know making sure that you're treating employees yeah. as well as you as, as well as possible. And I think you raise a good point because you don't want as a business to over promise only to find out that actually you can't actually deliver what you said you wanted to. And yeah. obviously a business needs to run. And uh, so it is that like you say having that balance it's, it's really important. Yeah and I think I mean if you know, one of the conversations that we were, um, Didi, you and I were having yesterday was all about planning and planning yes. in, in a different sense, but planning recruitment and looking forward and, you know, as departments and businesses grow, what are the different uh, milestones and what therefore are the different recruitment needs that will need at different points. It's actually the same sort of planning um, is is also kind of relevant across the piece, really, because, you know, the more that, we, from a retention point of view, the, the, the sooner... A, with employees telling people telling us as soon as possible um, when they're pregnant, it's really helpful because mm-hmm. then it enables you to properly succession plan and it enables them to it enables you to then get the their cover in place in plenty of time to make sure that the handover is um, really as stress free as possible um, because you can never tell quite when little babies wants to make an appearance <laughs> into the world. Yeah. So the more kind of planning, I think, I think the better um, just to make that end bit. Mm-hmm. Um, go as well as possible for the employee and, and for the business as yeah. well. 
Um, so, um, any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? <laughs> I think it's just, I mean, part of what I, what I do as well is this kind of campaigning for matrescence. It is telling people about it, educating yeah. people about it, because I think it is a bit of a piece of the perinatal mental health puzzle that is missing. I mean, I've never heard of perinatal. That is a term that perimenopause is a new term. Yeah. Me. Perinatal is a new term. What I, like, what is the so perinatal, perinatal bit basically kind of covers um, pregnancy and sort of postnatal. So okay. you can still say postnatal and stuff, but it kind of covers the idea that people, uh, you know, that's how their mental health is during pregnancy as well. And sometimes that's an indicator of how their mental health might be afterwards. Okay. Not always. Because then that's a funny old thing. Yeah. But sometimes it can be. So the term perinatal seems to kind of cover both, and that's what. You, and I do say perinatal because the packs, these packs get given out when they're pregnant. So the idea is that you kind of read the packs when you're about six months pregnant. It starts mm -hmm. to feel a bit more real. But yeah. that it's a bit surreal. Fair enough. You're mm -hmm. still sort of dealing with it. So you kind of read the packs then, and it can kind of help you get your head around pregnancy, and then. Sort of what happens afterwards but then you still got to almost refer back to it when you're in it yeah so it kind of kind of helps you um but i think it like it, it's i just think that matrescence is really important to stress i think a postnatal plan is really important to stress so yeah. in the uk we don't do postnatal plans we mm. just don't they do it a little bit in the us obviously their health system is something else um mm. but we don't do it and there is research to say it lessens the incidence of maternal distress and postnatal disorders yeah but we don't do them because so who would do who would do them if we did them here? I would. Um, no. oh, <laughs> like, like what I've done there. Like what I've done there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, like not really even have. planned. Not even planned. Blah, 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 blah. Um, no, I mean I think the difficulty with a postnatal plan is, like I, you know, I guess ideally it will come through the NHS, you know, or, uh, as part of that kind of uh, health disaster yeah. kind of thing. But the problem with the postnatal plan is you don't know what you don't know. So you don't really know what to put into it. Yeah. So you need a template to follow. And it's really overwhelming to think of all these things I'm meant to think about, yeah. what level of support I might need. So, you know, breastfeeding, for example, you touched upon it in terms of going back to work. And obviously um, the UK has one of the lowest rates of, of breastfeeding. It yeah. really does. Um, that is not our fault um, as, as mothers. It is... There's a lot of different factors, society's fault, uh, all kinds of things. But we are not properly supported within that, and therefore by the time a lot of people come back to work, they are no longer breastfeeding um, because they've either stopped much earlier on or mm -hmm. they've kind of done the year, and then it's like, right, I'm done now. You don't often see people breastfeeding longer than that, although they can if they want to. Um, and it's kind of about educating people that it's like, these things are harder than you think. They're not as mm. natural as you think. And you might need a certain level of support to put in place. But trying to find that support when you are really tired, mm. when your hormones are all over the place, when you feel like a failure because you can't feed your child, which is a common thing mm. that comes up again and again and again, you don't know where to go for it. But if you've done a postnatal plan, then you've already identified where that support is. You've already thought, at what point might I need a bit of support because I've looked into the pros and cons of you know, different elements of feeding. And you maybe even not drawn a line in the sand of when you're going to say, this isn't serving me anymore. Mm. And I'm not going to feel ashamed for that. And, but in, if you don't do that beforehand, it's very hard to do when you're in it. Yeah. Because it, you just can't think rationally. And you, you will put the blame on yourself. I, I don't know. There is nobody that I've spoken to that hasn't, which is really sad. Yes, yeah. so it is an emotional, and, an yeah. emotional and a roller coaster. It is, and it, and it's probably part of a a larger, um, systemic life of being a a, a woman and a mother mm. in modern days. But that's why I think things like this are really useful because they just prompt you. They give you mm. something, you know, the, the structure to use, um, and they can prompt you to use it. Some it, people will find parts of it useful and yeah. more useful than others. Yeah. But that's the same with, with everything, with everything. Yeah. But I think just having something there um, will, you know, can only help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Didi, any final thoughts from you? Um, I think something that we've probably not touched on is that the legislation does. I know we've had some statistics that aren't so positive but I think you can see the legislation has tried to help in the sense of if you take maternity leave well normal maternity leave 
you are entitled to come back to the same job. And if you take additional maternity leave, though you might not be able to come back to the very same job, you can come back to a similar one. You've got the right to that. Mm. And so women do have that sort of protection. Uh, but whether they, you know, for the reasons that we've discussed with make dressings, whether they actually want to come back after, you know, the brain's changed and they've got all these different priorities, I think that's a different yeah. sort of question. But that is something to bear in mind. And people uh, have the right to make a flexible working request. So if after they've come back to work and think, actually, this working pattern doesn't quite work, uh, work for me, um, they could be eligible to make a flexible working request to their employer and just say, actually, can I either work different hours, work a different routine, yeah. or work from home, for example, in a different location? So that's something to, to bear in mind um, that women still have those rights as well. And what so in that last instance, so la last last question, um in that last instance, what are the obligations on the employer? So for somebody who does come back and they do yeah. make a flexible working request, yeah. what are the what are the kind of legal requirements um for the employer's perspective? So an employer they have to consider it. Yeah. Uh, they can't just say no, no, no. They actually have to look at the business, yeah. see what the request is and see can we reasonably accommodate this balancing it against our business yeah. requirements um, and if not they need to be able to provide some of the prescribed reasons why they can't um, basically adhere to that request yeah so if for example they couldn't change the working hours or well, can you prove why why is that is yeah. that because we can't meet business needs or is it because we can't afford to do that yeah um, so that's something that women can fall back on if they feel that they need to change the way that they work in order to basically accommodate this new life that we've got being a mother. Okay, well, thank you very much both. Um, there's lots of something which we could probably sit and talk about yes. for days. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, but that has been really useful. Really good to know both some of the you know legal um you know specifics that we should all be aware of, and when we have both for our teams and for the businesses that we should bear in mind when we have employees who are pregnant, whether it's mother or father. Um, and also, um, Susanna, really useful to see yours and the postnatal plan and the sort of templates that, that can that can help spur the right conversation. Um, so thank you very much both. Um, and I'm sure that um, we will all be available always to answer any further questions yeah. on any of this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.